Uh, the first thing I say is people need to work. People have got nine. People are going to get this documentation, and they've actually got nine months by which to make a decision. So people don't actually have to make a decision quickly. People shouldn't let anyone use time as a weapon against them. They've got to do this in a very considered, um, careful sort of manner. And as a, and as, if you like, we've also just put up a chart here trying to show, if you like, an eight-step process by which they need to go through before they actually decide what they as they as they work through this process. So they're going to have most of them, as the minister said, more than three thousand have returned the consent forms. Um, we've, we're now going to we're sending out at the moment. We're couriering to um, the, the people these, um, if you like, the purchase offer documentation. They then need to take advice from whoever they can about what they what they're going to do next. They're going to need to get a lawyer involved, and as we've said already, that we've um, we're giving financial support on those those legal fees. Um, they then decide which of the two offers they're going to they're going to accept. And that we've stood up on that flow chart, that's about a lawyer, but there will be other people they'll, they'll want to consider as well. They've got, they're have got going to choose a settlement date, and then the lawyer will then, select, then submit to us, um, the, if you like, their completed, their completed offer, offer, offer document. We then go a process of checking what they've sent to us. We pay them a deposit in many cases, and then the, finally we're going to actually have to go out and, if you like, take possession of the home. So it's not like the classic thing like, you know, you go buy a car and trade me, where if you like the government's hit, you know, buy now, and we're just going to pop around with the cash and take the house off them. You know, there's a whole lot of other steps that are involved when you buy, when you buy and sell a house. And some of that is going to involve the fact that if before this transaction takes place, we need to make sure how much insurance money has been paid out. All those sort of details have to be worked through. So there is actually quite a complex flowchart showing all the things that have to go on in the back room to make this work. Um, we've got a lot of people on standby, ready to work through this transaction, both in terms of legal people um, and other people that need to work through the transaction. But, but um, we're not going to be able to handle all 5,000 people if they come through the door right away. But for the, the 40 or 50 who have said they're under severe hardship in terms of medical issues, those sort of things, we have to process them um, very quickly. Um, I think the process we're using here, we've discussed at length with CanCern who are the organisation, sort of an umbrella organisation representing community interests, and they've given us a lot of feedback to try and make this process, if you like, as, as people-friendly um, as possible. Um, part of what we're also launching today, of just moving on, is this, um, well, first of all, I say, the other, the other thing I mentioned today is there is this earthquake um, support service. And that's a service which is like um, to help people, through, well, just to generally help people, all the difficulties that are going on out there, and that's been um, a Sarah-led um, initiative, but, it worked, but it's been funding a whole bunch of other organisations out there with coordinators out there in the field helping people through these sorts of issues. Um, and at the moment, that service is currently looking after something like 3,000 3, households at the moment. Um, but they're people that can work with householders on an individual one-to-one -one sort of basis, helping them with their issues, whether it's about finding accommodation, where they can get support with their insurance issues, and so on. Um, and as part of trying to make, trying to get out of the community and give those people almost more of a face, um, today we've also opened um, a, an earthquake assistance centre, which is right next door, um, and that's part of that earthquake support service. Um, but it's a single place where people can get information from insurance companies, from EQC, meet community law, um, talk to people from... Um, the different, all the different agencies can help them, people like the Temporary Accommodation Service. Um, you know, for a lot of people, there's a really quite a daunting event that's happened, and for them to be able to go to one place and meet all the different organisations face-to-face, we think is going to be a very, very important initiative. So it's through there, at the, at the, um, in the, what used to be the pro shop there. Um, um, it's a service which is going to offer five days a week from 10 in the morning till 6.30 at night. Um, but I think for a lot of people, the opportunity to sit down face to face and meet representatives from all those different organisations is going to make um, is going to be very important. But it's also an opportunity for people people to meet other people in a similar situations and just talk about what they can do to actually go forward as well. You know, hi, I'm from the government. I'm here to help, and we certainly are. But in many cases, the people that can help these people are people who are neighbours and people who actually have got a similar situation. And we're trying to give as many opportunities for those sort of things, for those sort of things to, to occur. Um, while it's going to work five days a week at the moment, um, if necessary, we'll open it up at weekends. But having, ha to make that happen, we're going to have to need you know, the assistance of a whole range of other organisations to make that work. 
Um, if people also want to, um, if they don't just want to um, come in here, they can also ring up. There's the 0800 number um, where there's a whole lot of assistance as well. But we think for many people, turning up to a real place is going to be is going to be important. If they want to engage one of those ESS coordinators, they can ring 0800 777 846. Um, and that way we can put them in touch with one of these coordinators who can go and meet them in the comfort of their own home. Um, just, you know, there's a whole range of organisations which the ESS have been working with. Um, they include Age Concern, um, Barnardo's, um, a Actus, which is, I know always can get, can mix up with what that stands for, but it's the Aranui... What is it, the Aranui? Community Trust. The Aranui Community Trust. But what's the I for then? That's it's so. That's society. They didn't want to look like <laughs> Thank you, Leanne. I can't, I can't see from, from, from the back there. Bernardo's, the Christchurch Methodist Mission, the Christchurch Resettlement Service, the Women's Refuge, Home and Family, the Pacific Trust Canterbury, Presbyterian Support. Um, there's a whole, whole pile of organisations here. So I think it's, it's a fabulous, mm -hmm. fabulous initiative. And lastly, I was just going to talk a little bit about. Um, some of the other sort of infrastructure stuff. Um, as of today, um, there's still about 1,600 households which are still using um, chemical or portable toilets, um, and that's a drop from something like 45,000 after the February event. So 1,600 is still an awful lot of households that feel um, like they're all, but they're, you know, they've had to trudge out in the snow to empty their chemical toilets over the last week or so. But the goal is to have all those people off their chemical toilets by the end of August. And coming out here today, there's an awful lot of work going on here to try and make that happen, and the guys are still confident they're going to get there. Um, the stormwater, there's a lot of work going on there, and there's still 14 uh, waterways been cleared of silt to try and get that stormwater flowing, flowing better. You know, there were some sort of surface flooding issues over the last week, but I think it's actually been pretty amazing how well things have held up together. I guess I'd also notice the electricity system held up as well. You know, there was always a concern with all those underground damaged cables, as the water table came up, with some of those cables start to fail, but it's largely held together. It's been under an awful lot of stress. The loads in this area would have been the highest I've ever had, and it pretty much held up. And I think that's a real, that's a real um, tribute to all the guys that have worked so hard over the last few, over the last last six months. Um, roads. There's still 20 roads closed to earthquake damage, and that doesn't include all those roads closed in the CBD. But there's good progress in getting the roads back up open again. Silt removal. 380,000 tonnes of silt came out after February the 22nd, and there's about 100,000 came out after the June event. So that's kind of an interesting measure, that the June event was actually a really significant event. It was about a quarter of the amount of silt came out of the, came out of the, came out of the city compared to, that, compared to that outrageous February event. Um, we're doing some work at the moment to try and speed up um, the resolution of the orange areas. Um, some of the aerial photography the, using the LiDAR hasn't been able to happen over these last few weeks because of the weather. Um, we've decided the way the weather is, we're going to send um, survey teams out into the field, just guys out there or men and women with you know, conventional surveying equipment to try and speed that process up because it isn't going as fast as I'd, li as I'd like. And that work will continue until we've had a good enough spell of weather to be able to go out and do the LiDAR. This LiDAR where they fly over the city and try and get the levels, it requires clear weather, but it also requires there to be no snow on the ground because otherwise the LiDAR sees the snow and takes that as a level. So we've made the decision, look, we just can't, we've got to send, you know, we're going to, I'm not sure how many guys are being sent up there, but there's a big number of people going out there over the next week there. So some people may see people in their back gardens um, over these next few weeks doing that surveying work. Um, and the demolitions, we've got something like 78 teams in there working at the moment. Um, the snow closed things down for a couple of days. But there's 78 teams in there working with I don't know how many diggers and cranes and those sorts of things. Um, there's a 400 tonne crane, the largest in New Zealand is working at, at the Basilica at the moment. And I think right now on the sea, the world's third largest crane is coming here. And I think the Minister and I will probably fight over the rights to have the first guy pulling some levers on that. Oh, well, I'll... <laughs> um, and I think the last number, that's an outrageous number there, there's something like um, 38,000 38, um, trucker trailer units have gone out to, um, out to the Burwood landfill with, with stuff since this event happened. So 38,000 is sort of an extraordinary number. 
Um, and in terms of the number of buildings that have come down, I think we're now down to something like 370 have, been, have come down. It's like 1,200, 1200 buildings that need to come down, but 370 is actually an extraordinary effort. Um, and um, we're, I'm very happy with the progress we're making there.